In just two weeks, the course of our European history has changed, radically changed, and I believe for the good. Innocent Ukrainians, including children, many, many children, are suffering unbearable acts of barbarism unleashed upon them in a war that nobody wants. Not the Ukrainians, certainly not the Europeans, nor the Russians. It's just one man's war, Putin and his cronies. We must and will do everything we can to support Ukraine. Ukrainians are fighting for the values we believe in and the values we share. They're fighting for freedom, democracy and the rule of law against a regime that ridicules, rejects and actively tries to undermine us and our values. This is about Ukraine, but it's certainly also about Europe. We must defend European interests and increase our resilience by tackling our own vulnerabilities. It is abundantly clear that we are too dependent on Russia for our energy needs. It is not a free market if there is a state actor willing to manipulate it. The answer to this concern for our security lies in renewable energy and diversification of supply. Renewables give us the freedom to choose an energy source that is clean, cheap, reliable and ours. And instead of continuing to fund fossil fuel imports and fund Russian oligarchs, renewables create new jobs here in Europe. With the plan we outlined today, the EU can end its dependence on Russian gas and repower Europe. Fit for 55, once implemented, will reduce the EU's total gas consumption by, 20, by, sorry, by 30% by 2030. That is 100 billion cubic meters of gas we will no longer need. Now we will take it to the next level. By the end of this year, we can replace 100 BCM of gas imports from Russia. That is two-thirds of what we import from them. This will end our over-dependency and give us much-needed room to manoeuvre. Two-thirds by the end of this year. It's hard, bloody hard, but it's possible if we're willing to go further and faster than we've done before. Repower EU is our plan to make Europe independent from Russian gas. It is based on two tracks. First, we will diversify supply and bring in more renewable gases. With more LNG and pipeline imports, we can replace 60 BCM of Russian gas within the next 12 months. By doubling sustainable production of bio, uh, biomethane, we can replace another 18 BCM using the Common Agricultural Policy to help farmers become energy producers. We can also increase the production and import of renewable hydrogen. A hydrogen accelerator will develop integrated infrastructure and offer all member states access to affordable renewable hydrogen. 20 million tonnes of hydrogen can replace 50 BCM of Russian gas. We will also start replacing natural gas with renewable gases. This, in sum, is going to be the first pillar of Repower EU. In parallel, we must accelerate our clean energy transition. Renewables make us more independent and they are more affordable and reliable than the volatile gas market. So we need to put millions more photovoltaic panels on the roofs of our homes, businesses and farms. We must also double the installation rate of heat pumps over the next five years. This is low-hanging fruit. By the end of this year, almost 25% of Europe's current electricity production could come from solar energy. In addition to this, we need to speed up permitting procedures to grow our on- and offshore wind capacity and roll out large-scale solar projects. This is a matter of overriding public interest. Some of these changes will not happen overnight, and that's why we also need to prepare for next winter. By October, gas storage facilities in the EU must be filled up to 90% capacity, and the Commission is ready to support joint procurement of gas. Finally, and most importantly, 
We need to protect those who are struggling to pay their energy bills. Our plan today proposes several ways to help the most exposed households and businesses. Kadri will go through these in more detail. To conclude, Repower EU is our plan to break our dependency on Russian gas and to find freedom in our energy choices. We can do it, and we can do it fast. All we need is the courage and grit to get us there. If ever there was a time to do it, it's now. Gavri, over to you. Thank you, Franz. Good afternoon, everyone. Since um, this commission entered office, we have had many important meetings on energy, but uh, none more important than today. Putin's war on Ukraine has made it absolutely clear that we need to move even faster to reshape the European energy system and end our dangerous dependence on Russian fossil fuels as soon as possible. This is uh, not the first time we face this truth uh, in the EU after 20, uh, 2009 when Russia stopped gas deliveries to Ukraine. We have had worked uh, hard to diversify our supplies uh, and uh, that year, in 2009, um, LNG imports were just over 4 BCM per month. Now it's 10 BCM, with potential to grow. Since 2009, eight new LNG terminals have come online in the EU. Thanks to these efforts, we are in a much better position than we were five or ten years ago. But we are not yet where we need to be. In energy, Things take time, and um, the urgency to give up Russian gas was perhaps felt more strongly in some member states than others. Putin's actions uh, have made this urgency felt across the EU. We all agree that affordability, sustainability, and security concerns ultimately have the same answer, the Green Deal. By juggling these three goals will not be easy. First, let me talk about what we need to do now. We need to protect our people and businesses from the impact of exceptionally high prices. Energy prices have been surging since last autumn, aggravated by Gazprom's unusual behaviour, keeping gas flows low despite high prices. Russia's aggression against Ukraine has added to the price pressure, and markets are also nervous about the risk of Russian retaliation. In October, we adopted a toolbox of measures that has by now been used by almost every member state. But as the situation has evolved, it's no longer sufficient. In these extraordinary circumstances we are facing now, member states can regulate electricity prices for households and microenterprises. This is an option that the EU framework allows, and today we have published detailed guidance on how to de design these schemes. We will also launch consultations with member states on a new temporary crisis framework for state aid, similar to the one introduced to mitigate the impact of COVID. This could allow them to compensate businesses for part of the increase in energy costs related to the Russian invasion. To put these support measures in place, member states need funds. One thing they can consider is to temporarily tax windfall profits created by the exceptionally high electricity prices. Here as well, we have published guidelines for how this can be done. Member States can also use ETS revenues from January 2021 to February 2022. Emission trading has generated 30 billion euros for national budgets. This can be channeled to support consumers in these difficult times. Another immediate concern is to make sure that Europe is ready for an interruption of supply. We have assessed possible scenarios for partial and full disruption of gas flows from Russia. Thanks to the mild weather and increased LNG supplies, we expect to be on the safe side for this winter, but we need to get ready for the next one. For that, it is crucial to ensure that our gas storage is filled when the next heating season starts. In April, we will propose legislation to require that the storage in each member uh, well, that the storage is at least 90 per cent full. By, first of, uh, by the beginning of the heating season. And the proposal will also identify gas storage as critical infrastructure and tackle ownership risks. Looking ahead, there is a clear need for a more coordinated EU policy on gas. 
on buying and storing, and also diversification of supply is important, and improving infrastructure as we move away from Russian gas. And this is what we will do under the Repower EU initiative. LNG deliveries to the EU have already massively increased, but there is room and a need for more, as we are not ready yet to give up gas entirely. We must make sure that as much of it as possible comes from non-Russian sources. The other side of the coin is reducing the need for fossil gas in the first place by boosting alternatives and saving energy. This means more biomethane and renewable hydrogen, more renovation, heat pumps and solar panels on rooftops. It means getting serious about saving energy, which should become everyone's contribution to solving this current crisis. Let me just mention something on permitting to complement that France already shared with you. We cannot talk about renewables revolution if getting a permit to build a wind park takes seven years. It is time to treat these projects as being in the overriding public interest, because they are. We will propose that Member States create go to areas that are particularly suitable for renewable projects. We will publish a re recommendation to speed up permitting for renewable energy projects, and we should be ready to consider changing our current rules if they are holding us back. I would like to end with the same topic. Fraud started with Ukraine. There is little to add to what has already been said about the Russian aggression, the bravery of Ukrainian people and the united response of the EU. So let me just talk about energy. Ukraine is part of Europe, and that should be also the case for their energy system. We have committed to link their power grid to the European continental grid as soon as possible. This will help to keep the, the Ukrainian power system stable and the lights on. We are also working around the clock to ensure the necessary supplies of gas, coal, diesel, jet fuel, generators and other energy needs that Ukraine has right now. And I thank and I want to thank member states who are delivering urgent and necessary help, because Ukraine's security is also Europe's security. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now go to your questions. Yes, please. Hi, this is Shandor from Euronews. I would like to know how do you pre, uh, defend families, how do you protect families and businesses from the rising uh, energy prices that we can expect? And the second question, if I may, what do you think about the Hungarian government's statement that they still want to go ahead with a favorable gas deal that they have with Russia and they also want to build a Russian nuclear reactor together with Rosatom? Thank you handle the second question, and, and uh, I'll leave the first question to Kadri. You know, member states are sovereign in their energy choices. They are bound by our collective commitment to reduce our emissions with at least 55 per cent by 2030 and to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Um, and I think the Hungarian government will have to explain their choices to the Hungarian people uh, and not to us. On energy prices, uh, well, today's communication confirms that member states can regulate energy prices, electricity prices, uh, for households and micro-enterprises. And this is an existing option uh, that the EU framework allows already, and we have now published guidelines. Uh, and this detailed guidance um, to member states uh, explains how they can design their schemes to set uh, the prices. Uh, Edith de Vries from the Netherlands. Uh, Mr. Timmermans, I'd like to know something about the dates. I hear you talk, I say, within a year or within nine months you want to achieve something. I believe it's the 35 million uh, gas. And I hear you talk about in five years we should have doubled this and we should have that. Do I understand correctly that you already want this year to produce double amount of bi biogas so that we can that, that we use less from the Russians? What we want to do this year is to reduce our dependency on Russian gas imports with two-thirds. Um, that's what we want to do this year. And there's a, a whole range of measures we need, as I've enumerated them, we need to take for that, uh, find alternatives. Obviously, Kadri's been doing incredible work 
working with potential uh, providers of those alternatives. Also, I think what Kadri said earlier about um, asking citizens, telling them your choices in how much energy you consume, decide how str co decide how strong we are in our reaction uh, to Russia. You know, by, by lowering the temperature in your house if you can, uh, by being more conscious in the choices you make that lead to energy consumption, you can substantially contribute to reducing our energy consumption and thus make us stronger vis-à-vis -vis Russia. But excuse me, I heard you say that you want a lot more biogas, yes. mostly made by farmers, I presume. Yep. Yep. They have to do that already this year. Well, we have to, we have to, I mean, you can't immediately, it's not a switch you can, you can change, but there, there is um, agricultural production get, that can be directed at, but there's also agricultural waste, as you know, that can be used, and that can be used already short term uh, for the production of uh, biomethane, as you know, and we will have to incentivize farmers to do that and help them also to do that quickly, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Lorenzo Consoliasca News. I would like to ask uh, two questions. One uh, concerning the, the coherence of the EU. It's clear that we have seen uh, an action that we have never seen uh, in this scale before, uh, very severe sanctions, but uh, this is a plan that, uh, needs, that, that uh, uh, has the aim to get rid of the dependency from the Russian gas, but is it not too late anyway? We are giving what, 200 million every day to Russia for the gas that the Russia keep uh, give to, to, to the EU. There is still gas passing through Ukraine, Russian gas, to, to come to the EU. Is it not completely paradoxical that we take sanctions, we block the central bank, and then we give them every day to that 200 million? And uh, uh, another thing, is, it, is there uh, a project, there was a, uh, a, a, an article on Bloomberg today, a project about uh, uh, issuing bonds, uh, common debt, uh, to finance uh, uh, energy and defence spending of the EU is something that is coming, uh, because this would be a really revolutionary thing. Thank you. Uh, on your second question, we have no such plans in the Commission. I don't know if they might be in some member states, but we have no such plans in the Commission. On your first question, well, it would be very good in politics if you could turn back time. Uh, and then, you know, go back in time and then take better decisions than you uh, have taken. But we are, uh, we are handling uh, the cards we were dealt, and we have to play those cards as well as possible. Um, I think Kadri and I are among those who've warned for a long time about too, too much dependency on Russia and who've had no illusions about Mr. Putin and his regime for a long time. I think that is very clear. But we are where we are, and now we need to move much quicker than we've done in the past to reduce our dependency on imports uh, of energy uh, from Russia. And that is the proposal we're putting on the table now. We're, sadly, um, the rewriting of history might be an interesting uh, exercise, but it doesn't produce any results in the real world. Uh, do you have a date for when you want to be fully independent from Russian gas? And what are the measures that the European Commission plans to phase out coal and oil? Thank you. You want to handle the, do you want me to handle the first one or the second one? You want to handle both? It's up to you, Catherine. Well, I didn't uh, phase out coal and oil as such, or, uh, or Russian imports. To phase out the Russian imports of coal and oil. Well, we do have um, contingency plans in place for the case if there will be full disruption of uh, gas supply from Russia. That means that partially we can replace it with uh, uh, deliveries from other suppliers. Partially we can replace uh, natural gas with other sources of energy. And partially we can well, improve our energy efficiency. So saving is, is a key word. Uh, then on oil, uh, all member states do have in place strategic oil stock worth of 90 days. Some of them do have even more. And, uh, and this is uh, our strategic reserve for the case if there is a, um, a disruption of, uh, of oil uh, from Russia. And, and on coal, well, there are not so many member states who are dependent on uh, um, imported coal because, well, coal is a fossil fuel that is also produced here in Europe.
This one, okay. Angela Mauro of Post Italy. Uh, I'd like to have a comment on uh, the U.S. embargo on uh, petrol imports from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, it looks like it's going to be announced in the next few hours, and it looks like uh, Great Britain is on, of the same advice. Thanks. Well, I think we should wait with our comments until we've heard the announcement, uh, and then we'll follow up on that. Okay, I will take it from uh, the uh, platform Interaxio. We'll try to connect to David. Hello, is this working? Yeah, go ahead, David. Ah, oh, great. Um, Mr. Timmermans, um, I had a question. It's, um, it's moving on from energy, but, well, gas, but um, in, I'm looking forward to winter to 2022 and 2023. Um, Luxembourg Energy Minister Turner says we should look at shutting down some gas-intensive industries. That obviously includes fertilizers. And um, I listened to you last night in the Energy Committee, and you, you said we need to cut imports of Russian fertilizers. Um, I, I was wondering if, what is the Commission going to do in terms of these energy intensive, well, gas intensive industries? And then on a particular point with Hungary, um, they, they're sensing a food crisis. And on Friday, they banned exports of cereals and oil, se se uh, oil seeds. Is, is that legal under EU law? Thanks. On, on your uh, first question, I think we need to support European industry also European energy intensive industry to move towards uh, using renewable energy as a source, not banning the industry. We need to give them this opportunity. I think there's a huge opportunity when we have a hydrogen economy to have this energy uh, uh, intensive industry, high caloric uh, 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 industry still in Europe, but then in a sustainable way. Um, of course, in farm to fork, we're incentivizing our farmers to use less fertilizers, but we're not saying to them you can use no fertilizers. So fertilizers will be needed. Fertilizers need to be affordable. They are almost not affordable today uh, because of where the market is. And fertilizers also need to come from Europe as much as possible um, and also become <laughs> sustainable. So uh, that is, I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would argue, that is a, a, a more constructive and a more productive approach than just banning certain industries. I, I, would, I would like to give them the opportunity to reinvent themselves in a world uh, where we will be moving towards a sustainable energy. On the issue of um, uh, uh, food, uh, uh, I don't think there is a risk for Europe. Um, uh, we can sustain ourselves in terms of food. There will be an increase in food prices, what you can expect. Um, um, and I would believe that you know, the, the one thing that makes us strong, and this is something we've seen in the last weeks, is if we stand together and if we find common European solutions to what are clearly common European challenges, like we did uh, uh, um, after, after a, a, a more difficult beginning, like we did also in the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And I think this should also be the response now. So, so I hope we can have European-wide solutions to this challenge uh, and not individual member states taking these measures. I, I can't answer the question whether this is legal or not. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, I might refer to my colleagues to give you an answer uh, a bit later. But I would urge all member states to look for common European solutions. That is what makes us strong also as individual member states. Thank you. I take another question uh, from the uh, interactive platform. David Carretta. David. Thank you very much, David Carretta, Radio Radical Italian Radio. Two questions, if, if I may. Uh, 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 it will take some time, and uh, I can imagine, a lot of money to, to front load uh, all the project on uh, wind, on hydrogen, and so on. If you are not planning uh, a new European instrument uh, uh, to, uh, to push for this, uh, uh, energy independence, uh, uh, where member states uh, should find the money to, to, um, to invest uh, in this, uh, in this uh, energy independence? Uh, and the second question, if I may, on, on nuclear, uh, would you advise to delay the phasing out from nuclear um, in some member states that they are planning to, to do that in the next few uh, months or years? Thank you. 
On, on the energy transition, in many of the national uh, recovery and resilience plans, there is elements of energy transition and also energy efficiency. Um, so already a lot of the money that is allocated to our recovery could be spent in that direction. Now, if more money were needed, uh, which is something one could argue, that is something for uh, the European Council to look at uh, in, uh, later this week. Um, we're now proposing something that could give the European Council a guideline of how we can reduce our dependency, how we can tackle the issue of the risk of energy poverty, how we can come up with a combination of answers to uh, the high energy prices, how we can make sure we have enough resilience uh, in the year to come. And now it's for the uh, European Council to debate that and to see how they would want us to take uh, that uh, uh, forward. On nuclear, I repeat, uh, member states are free in the choices they make in terms of their energy mix. They are bound legally bound by the climate law in terms of the emission reductions they need to attain. And I've seen various member states making statements saying, in this situation, there should be no taboo. Minister Habeck in Germany, etc. I saw the Belgian government also making uh, statements to, to the same, uh, in the same uh, gist. So that's for member states uh, to decide. We will support them in the choices they make. Um, uh, it is... It is f imaginable that some member states would, would decide to, for instance, um, not uh, use gas as a transitional energy carrier, but then remain a bit longer with nuclear or with coal than they had imagined. If that is combined with a speeding up of the introduction of renewable energy for climate and for our energy uh, self-sufficiency, that could be uh, two wins. If I just uh, can add how we will front load those necessary investments, well, um, you can regard them as investments because uh, if you will invest into your own production, homegrown renewables, uh, then this helps us to, well, to replace the imports with uh, own production. And, uh, and um, one of the big bottlenecks is per permitting. So there might be uh, well, projects. Um, in the pipeline, but permitting takes time, so we will address very soon uh, this, uh, this um, um, barrier. And, and on uh, saving energy and energy efficiency measures, right now uh, in, uh, in uh, Nice, the housing ministers, EU 27 housing ministers, ministers who are responsible for renovation, are well, uh, uh, do have their meeting and discussing exactly how they can scale up the renovation, because uh, this is uh, not only uh, helping us to get rid of uh, natural gas, which is uh, broadly used for heating, but it also helps us to tackle high energy prices or heating prices. So, so um, there is a political willingness to, to improve uh, in this regard. And, of course, we have to cooperate with international financial institutions so that, uh, on top of grants, there will be also favourable loans available. Thank you. If I could ask all of you to put your mobile phones on. Uh, yeah. No ringtone, please. Yes, please. Mr. Timmermans, Laurens Bove from uh, Brussels News. Um, your plan, Repower EU, is a fascinating name, by the way. I think you have very creative people working for you in naming your projects. It's, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'll pass on the compliment. Okay. Repower EU, that means less uh, Russian gas, but it also means less gas in total, huh? as you said. Um, uh, two questions in that consent, uh, context. Um, first of all, what does it mean for uh, the place from, for gas on the list of the taxonomy? Uh, does this also change, uh, or are you still, uh, have a good, uh, do you still think it's a good idea to have it on the list? And secondly, um, in order to speed up the production of renewable energies, you also need a, we will need a lot of imports of all sorts of metals that we need in order to build these factories that can produce all this renewable energy. Um, is there any way that it's possible to uh, have these kinds of import increments in, from all these uh, rare materials? Well, first of all, um, we don't say no to all uh, fossil fuel immediately uh, because we will need uh, over a uh, a period of time, we will need base load coming from nuclear and, and, uh, and also fossil fuels. Um, the quicker we can move to other 
uh, non-fossil gases like hydrogen and ammonia, the better it is. But in some time, we will also need uh, these other fossil fuels. Um, in that context, gas can still be a transitional energy carrier. Um, the only thing is, what we're saying now is we need to wean ourselves of the dependency of Russian gas. That's what we're saying, uh, because that comes uh, with uh, high political risks in a completely new geopolitical situation we're in. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be out of gas immediately across the board. So in that context, for countries moving towards renewables, natural gas can still be um, a, a bridge especially if the infrastructure you build is going to be pre-fitted for the post-natural gas, gas situation with hydrogen and ammonia and other gases with other densities but that don't have um, a carbon component. Um, um, on your second question, you know, what we're trying to do in this fundamental transformation, that comes with a lot of challenges. And you've mentioned one of them, which is raw materials. Uh, and we will need to invest massively in also uh, R&D, to reduce our dependency on raw materials we don't have ourselves, uh, to make sure that we make uh, our products more circular, uh, recyclable. All of that is uh, on the way, and the, I, I think the European battery strategy is, is one of those areas where you can see this happening in, in uh, real time. But the raw materials is only one of the challenges. The um, uh, workforce we need is another challenge, uh, uh, because with all the plans we have, just imagine all the uh, rooftop solar PVs, the uh, uh, offshore wind, the uh, energy efficiency of buildings. You need people to do that. So it's a huge job opportunity uh, for Europe. But then you also have to find the people who can fill those jobs. And that's another challenge I would like to mention, on top of the challenge you have mentioned. Just to underscore that I'm not here, we're not standing here, Kadri and myself, to say this is going to be in any way easy. Uh, but I am also deeply convinced that even if it's not easy, even if it's going to be very hard, it is something we need to do because now it's also intimately linked to our security. Thank you. Uh, I go to the platform, Marco Bressolin. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Marco. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, in the communication, you mentioned the possibility for member states to introduce temporary tax on uh, extra profits for the companies of the energy sector. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more uh, the scope of this measure? Thank you. Well, yes, indeed, uh, we are well... Uh, mm, uh, well, this, uh, this um, communication is accompanied with, uh, with uh, specific guidance and, uh, and uh, this uh, gives us member states a explanation uh, what we consider to be a windfall profit uh, um, caused by extraordinary high uh, gas prices. And, and this is one opportunity how they can um, uh, tackle the current situation where uh, extraordinary high natural gas prices will have a consequence in their electricity market. Thank you. Another question from the platform, Isabel Ok, ça ne marche pas, donc je reviens à la salle. Matisse. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Matthijs Schiffers, head of Financiële Dagblad. I'm struggling a little bit with the obligation for member states to fill up their storage with 90% um, by the uh, ahead of the um, heating season. What would be the consequence if they if they don't do that? Um, because you could say they are now forced to buy gas. Um, potentially for other member states, at very high prices. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Thanks. Um, well, uh, this is a, uh, a proposal uh, based on solutions that many member states have already introduced in the national legislation. And if we compare the situation in these markets where national legislation is already in place, then uh, the storage... Uh, um, filling rates are significantly higher than in these member states where uh, they are not. And, uh, and um, well, we do agree that uh, gas storage is not the silver bullet and, 
and we need to continue to reach out to the other suppliers to accelerate the use of uh, alternative uh, um, gas routes. Um, but well, then the storage owners can't participate at the market anymore, and, and uh, our member states uh, will have to well uh, unbundle the, the storage. Um, on, uh, well, there is a ownership risk, and, uh, and we uh, intend to put in place clear provisions um, for an effective monitoring and enforcement, both at member state and EU level. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, member states can empower, empower their action um, to apply fines in case of non-compliance with storage obligation. And, uh, and on, well, as I was mentioning already before, uh, we plan to classify gas storage as critical infrastructure. And this means that member states will certify that ownership by a person um, from a third country. Um, and, and, well, uh, in case of negative assessment, uh, then ownership unbundling could be required. Thank you. Right. Sir? Yeah. Yeah, Andy Bounds from the Financial Times. Just another one on, on storage. Uh, were you referring to Gazprom there, who obviously own a lot of storage in the EU? Um, I think their levels, according to the paper, are 16%. You want them to do 90%. Um, how are you going to oblige them to do that? And secondly, what incentives are there? The earlier paper had more incentives for storage. Now we just have a 100% cut on transmission fees, and obviously gas in storage, can, the price can go up and down. Um, and people may, may not want their gas to be sitting, um, you know, high price gas sitting in while, while prices possibly, go, you know, fall. Well, yes, uh, this uh, proposal indeed targets existing storage. So uh, for these member states who don't have storage, uh, we do not oblige them to, uh, um, to create a new storage facility. Uh, but um, say that we know that if gas storage will be filled before heating season, then all uh, member states will benefit. And uh, benefits of having a guaranteed high filling level are not limited. Um, only for those countries who do have storage. So this is why we will encourage to look at storage and filling levels in a regional perspective. And, and uh, the legal proposal will set out a mechanism to ensure a fair allocation of the security of supply costs among member states benefiting from the gas storage in a spirit of solidarity. Thank you. Okay, we try again with uh, Isabel Ori. Um... We connect you, Isabel, and then... No. Oui. Ah, voilà. Vas-y. Bonjour. Euh, J'ai une question en français. Je, je lis dans la communication que, que vous écrivez que si on diminue la température de 1 degré dans les bâtiments, euh, ça permettrait d'économiser 10 milliards de mètres cubes. Je voulais savoir si c'était un appel que vous lanciez d'ores et déjà aujourd'hui euh, aux consommateurs européens, aux citoyens européens, de, de baisser le chauffage euh, chez eux et, et dans les bâtiments. Merci. Well, I have to excuse myself because I heard what is, what is happening at the plenary session, the interpretation. <laughs> no, je, je <laughs> Somehow I managed to. Alors, je, je, je vais répondre à la question. Moi, je crois qu'il est important que nos citoyens soient informés euh, que leur comportement peut avoir euh, une influence positive sur la consommation d'énergie. Et si on voit les quantités euh, qui, sont, euh, qui sont impliquées, c'est quand même par un petit changement de comportement, collectivement, on peut, un, on peut avoir un impact énorme sur la consommation d'énergie. Donc, en changeant notre comportement en tant que citoyen, nous pouvons nous débarrasser en partie de la dépendance de, de gaz russe. Donc je crois que ce ce n'est pas un appel, c'est une information pour nos citoyens, mais une, mais une information que je crois très utile. Ok, thank you. This brings us to the end of this first press conference. We now have a second press conference also on an extremely important issue, which is the support provided by the European Union to uh, people fleeing the conflict. Stay with us. It will start in a few minutes. Thank you.